Um, some men are going to be coming forward with Bibles. If you need a Bible to follow along as we read today in our service, please raise your hand, and they'll be sure to get you one. Um, when you have your Bibles, you can begin turning to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, and as we prepare for a communion in just a few minutes, um, I'd like for us to consider Jesus' words in John 5. The setting is familiar, and it was the Sabbath, and Jesus had just, been, had just healed a paralyzed man, and this apparent disregard of the Sabbath response um, has upset the Jewish leaders, and Jesus responds to his accusers in verse 17. So John chapter 5, verse 17, But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. And for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father and making himself equal with God. So not only is Jesus working on the Sabbath, but he claims that he is working alongside God the Father. And by Jesus calling God his Father, the Jewish leaders rightly take him as making himself equal with God, further inciting their anger. In verse 19, Jesus answers and was saying to them, "'Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing, and the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes." For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Jesus' opponents are curiously right and wrong. Jesus does make himself equal with God, but they imagine that he is doing so in such a way as to claim to be an alternative God, a, a second God, and they believe that monotheism is under attack. But what Jesus has in mind is rather different. In verses 19 through 30, Jesus articulates what would become this distinctively Christian understanding of monotheism. Jesus insists that he is not a separate deity, an independent deity, far from it. He insists that the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. And in verse 19, for whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. Here we see Jesus' dependence. Jesus' actions are not independent of the Father, but always intimately dependent upon him and in concert with him. And so two elements in verse 19 in this clause, for whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner, two elements are striking. Number one, the Son's activities are, are coextensive with the Father. They, they cover the same extent. They correspond. Has the Father created all things? So also has the Son. You see that in John 1, 4. Is it the Father's prerogative to give resurrection life, raise the dead, and exercise final judgment? So also is it the Son's. And the second striking element centers around the words for or because in verse 19, and it demands explanation. In what way does the truth that whatever the Father does, the Son also does, how does that provide the ground or the explanation of the truth that the son can only do what he sees the father doing. The second clause explains the first on the assumption that the son sees everything that the father does. For whatever the father does, the son also does. The son not only does what he sees the father doing, and the son does everything the father does, this demonstrates a union between the father and the son. 
When the father acts, the son sees, and the son engages in the same activity. Since the son sees all that the father does, the son is always acting with the father, and the father and the son, and the father always acting with the son. Jesus both rejects and accepts the charge that he makes himself equal with God. He he rejects it in that he avoids any suggestion that he is some form of independent God, a second God, or an alternative God. Since all that he does is utterly dependent on the Father, but he accepts the charge that he makes himself equal with God in that whatever the Father does, he also does, and he is also, notice, entitled to receive the same honor as the Father. Verse 23, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. So he is deserving of the same honor. And as finite beings, we'll never fully grasp the mysteries that we see in this passage. This mysterious union of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it is an opportunity to contemplate our King and our Savior in his beauty and to affirm what the Bible says. You know, we, we contemplate a son who comes from the Father but is not the Father. He is engaged in the same works of God as the Father. He is equal with the Father, but yet he is distinct. Hebrews 1.3 puts it this way. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. So each week during communion, we, we take a piece of bread and a cup, which symbolizes Jesus' broken body and his spilled blood on the cross. And it is at the cross where we see the ultimate demonstration of both the divine union of the Father and the Son and all that they do and the dependence of the Son on the Father. The Father poured out his wrath for our sin and Jesus, intent on the same saving purposes as the Father, willingly laid his life down so that he would be the penalty for our sin. It pleased the father to crush the son, and the son laid his own life down for the sheep, and it was his authority to take his life back up again. And we as sinners could never pay the penalty due our sin, so God purposed to put our sin on his son, who alone could satisfy the just penalty for the sin that we deserved. Believers, have you grown so comfortable with these truths? that the stark realities of the gospel have lost their luster and amazement? You know, do we stand in amazement that God's eternal plan was to save sinners through the willing sacrifice of the perfect, fully divine son on the cross? Believers, remember these truths. Worship because of them. Turn from any unconfessed sin that you have today and worship Jesus this morning as we remember this. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, we'd ask that you would pass the plate to the next person as it comes to you without taking the bread and the cup, but we're glad that you're here because Jesus offers you salvation today. God offers you salvation. All mankind has sinned against God, and we have incurred this penalty, incurred this debt of sin that we can never pay on our own. But yet Jesus satisfied it for all who would believe in him. So what are you depending on right now to be right with God? Do you depend on your own morality, your own sense of goodness? Only by turning away from your own self-dependence and turning to follow Jesus and trusting in him alone as the only one, because he was divine, who was able to live a perfect life and satisfy the penalty that our sin deserved, only by turning to him today can you find rescue from your sin. We would love to speak with you or anyone you see up here in the front today or after our service, one of our pastors will be at the information table to speak to you about what does it mean to know Christ, to be rescued by him. For believers, um, men in the back, you can go ahead and come forward and serve us. Uh, Believers, when you receive the cup, and the bread today. Remember this amazing Jesus and worship with us today. And you can go ahead and take communion on your own.